This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University, and today I want to talk about the best investment for the next 100 years. If you're interested in learning how the stock market actually works so you can make money in both bull and bear markets, or you just want to see what I'm trading or investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So this video is especially for you if you really missed out on a lot of the social media stocks, a lot of the internet stocks, really the big money that was made over the past 20 years. I was lucky enough to be living in Silicon Valley and really be at the heart of it and participate in a lot of it. And I've learned a lot from this lesson and I want to share it with you. I still remember the days when people in the late 90s especially would would do these say these things like all internet stocks are frauds, Amazon is in a bubble, etc. And this was really widely accepted. But I think one of the keys to investing into investing for the long term is you have to to use the great Wayne Gretzky quote, you have to skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. And Warren Buffett has his own version of this, which is basically in the business world, the rear view mirror is always clearer than the windshield. In other words, if you're looking at past performance and thinking about previous states of the world, you won't be able to make as much money as if you're thinking about where the world is heading to and future states of the world. So in skating to where the puck is going to be is really trying to imagine a future state of the world and think about how something is currently priced and how it would be priced if we get that future state of the world. So I get a lot of people saying, why are you talking about Bitcoin? I, I just want to learn about how to invest in dividend stocks like McDonald's and Coke. Now, the problem with this is it's already been done. When Buffett was buying Coke in the late 80s, it was very controversial. People thought he was buying too high. He was paying too high of a PE for the shares, etc. But now Coke is a very uh, slowly growing company. Its revenues are growing very slowly. And it's not going to make anyone rich, even if you put your whole paycheck into Coke. So we really, the reason Buffett invested in Coke is he saw that it was very popular in maybe uh, North America and Europe. And it was beginning to expand to to Asia and South America and Africa and the rest of the world. And so he was basically investing in it as a growth stock. A lot of people don't realize that. And so he's very good at looking to where the, uh, the puck is going to be, or at least he used to be when he, was, when he was younger. So this brings us to cryptocurrencies. I love this article, uh, this entry in Wikipedia. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been identified as speculative bubbles by several laureates of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences central bankers and investors. Uh, these are people obviously who have a stake in the previous system and are not as interested in the forward system. And you also, you never want to take investment advice from someone with a degree in economics or certainly not a Nobel Prize in economics. You can just witness long-term capital if you want to see what happened with that, the big hedge fund that blew up in the late 90s. But this is great as part of this, part of this article. It talks about how Bitcoin crashed from 8,900 to 6,200 uh, and how this is some sign that there's a bubble. We're currently trading between 10,000 and 11,000 as I recorded this. Now, I remember something very similar. I remember actually reading this article in Newsweek, Newsweek the internet bah, why cyberspace isn't and never will be nirvana. It's still on the, New on the Newsweek website. What's ironic is Newsweek has gone away. All that's left is a website on this internet that they said would never succeed. This article, they actually changed the title to Why the Web Won't Be Nirvana because they didn't want to be totally embarrassed. But this is a snapshot of what the original article said. And just to, um, this is one of those famous articles that people, people poke fun at because, I mean, it's an interesting article because Clifford Stoll was actually a very smart guy. Uh, you can see if I scroll up here, you'll see the picture of him. He looks like a mad scientist genius, and I'm sure he was. And yet in the late 90s, when this was published, he had trouble envisioning that anyone would ever buy a book or a newspaper over the internet. That's what I highlight right here. He says, uh, basically, the internet's unusable. There's just a lot of junk on there. What the internet hucksters won't tell you is that the internet is one big ocean of unedited data. This was, of course, before Google and search engines. I think Yahoo search engine was probably around at this point. Uh, logged onto the World Wide Web, I hunt for the date of the Battle of Traf Trafalgar. So basically, he was unable, in spite of his, his uh, genius, to foresee a state of the world that actually came about just a couple years after he penned this article. And I see similar things in my YouTube comments. I see comments like this. I don't want to pick on these people. I've left out their names. But I see a lot of similar comments 
I would like to see Bitcoin sustain a move beyond 10K before I get aboard this hype train. Watching Bitcoin poke its head briefly above the 10,000 level and get hammered down does not bode well, in my honest opinion. Uh, the title of this video is The Height of Your Responsibility, Bitcoin is Doomed, blah, blah, blah. So you get a lot of comments like this. And these commentators may be right, or they may not be. But I think that if you're focusing on, I do a lot of stuff with technical analysis and charting, etc. But when you're looking at very large multi-decade trends, this sort of price action is not that important. And to just say that the Federal Reserve can stop Bitcoin shows that you haven't been watching all of my uh, YouTube videos, which is fine, of course. But I would like to see people like this uh, really question their own assumptions so they don't end up looking like a Clifford Stoll. Even as late, people forget this, even as late as 2010, people were talking about that Amazon was this giant bubble and who knows how much it's gone up since then, maybe 20, 20x, I don't have the, the chart in front of me. Uh, but they were saying that it was irrationally priced, coming out of a deep bear market, one of the greatest uh, companies ever um, ever, ever created. And people are saying, well, it's not profitable, etc. But obviously, they're using the, law, the wrong metric. So one thing I want to point out about cryptocurrency, which I think is the investment for the next 100 years, and especially an investment in terms of learning how to understand it. So if you were studying the internet, as I was in the late 90s, and you were really thinking about where things were headed, you realize that even when the dot-com crash happened in 2000 and 2002, this was not the end of things. This was really the beginning of things. And when Peter Thiel did an article with, I believe it was with Bloomberg in 2002 or 2003, where he was talking about how the internet was just getting started, it was widely, widely mocked. I remember that interview very well. So we're, we're still in the very, very early days of cryptocurrency. In fact, we can make an analogy here. We're still at the point of infrastructure and protocols. The two most famous protocols that help, that are sort of the backbone of the internet are TCP IP, which has to do with internet transfer protocols, and then SMTP, which is used, uh, still used for mail. And so what a lot of people don't realize is when they're looking at Bitcoin, they don't realize they're actually looking at an internet protocol. They're not just looking at a coin that you can fork and make your own coin. It's something that's that's very fundamental. And um, I think that's that's one helpful way of looking at it. When you have the reason protocols are so successful is they're surrounded by network effects. Once a lot of people are using them, it becomes very difficult to move beyond them. So there may be better ways of sending data than TCP IP. And obviously these protocols have been built upon, but the fact remains that they're still there at the backbone of the internet. And when I say we're at the point of infrastructure and protocols, I'm thinking back of, on companies like Global Crossing, which ultimately did go bankrupt, but they were responsible for laying all the cables under the ocean and connecting North America to Asia and North America to Europe. Ultimately, this CapEx, this, these capital expenditures, this infrastructure building was financed by equity investors and bond investors who ended up losing most of their money. But I use this more as a, a demonstration that sometimes bubbles or a lot of interest in an area can create, um, can create the infrastructure, can help to fund the infrastructure that then everything is built on. I think Bitcoin's a little bit different. I don't think it's, it, it doesn't exist in the real world like this in the sense that they have, it has huge capex and that it's laying the infrastructure and then it's going to go bankrupt. It's a very, it's a very different sort of thing. But I'm using these examples of TCP IP and SMTP and Global Crossing to suggest that we're still in the early days, the early days of protocols, of infrastructure, of the basic building blocks of what will create the cryptocurrency revolution. Here's TCP, TCP IP, uh, SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And I'm sure some of you know a lot more about this than I do. Um, but this is one way to one way to sort of time where we are now. What's one reason I'm so interested in DeFi, decentralized finance, is that th there are these protocols being built, and they're very interesting, mostly decentralized protocols like Compound, which is a, a lending borrowing pro, uh, protocol. There's MakerDAO, which creates Dai, which is a stablecoin. This is uh, this you know these uh, these names sound like nonsense to a lot of people in the same way that social media or social networking or uh, 
or SMTP sounded like nonsense in the late 90s and early 2000s. Another way to sort of think about where we are, I view Bitcoin as decentralized gold, as digitized digital gold. Gold has been used for five, 10,000 years by the, by the human species, and we're currently at year 11 with Bitcoin. People wonder, ask why isn't Bitcoin hitting new highs? We're just in year 11. This is very, very, very early. And I do think that Bitcoin will win the store of value category as a, as a very easy way for people to store wealth in a scarce asset. So I think Bitcoin wins that, but I think there's still just a huge amount in the space. In the process of winning the store of value category, I think Bitcoin goes from about 10,000 where it is today into the millions. I think this is this is almost a, a, a given at this point. And maybe I'll end up sounding as crazy as Clifford Stoll, but I'm willing to willing to stick my neck out on that. Simply because as we've seen with the internet, you tend to have categories be winner take all. So Facebook really captured its space. There was room for Twitter, obviously, and there's room for Instagram. Of course, Instagram got rolled into got rolled into Facebook. But this is there's a there's a real uh, tendency when because of network effects and because of how uh, communication works and the, the internet works for winners to capture most of a category. So I think Bitcoin wins the digital gold category, but there's still so much that needs to be done. Uh, if you've ever transferred stock, um, I recently had to transfer some stock for a couple IPOs, and it's still just an incredibly slow, ridiculous process that involves lots of phone calls and lots of paperwork. Eventually, all stocks, bonds, real estate, everything is going to be put onto some form of blockchain or another, whether it's the Ethereum network, uh, probably not Bitcoin, but whether it's Ethereum or some competitor or some new crypto that hasn't been invented, or maybe it's more local blockchains, this is going to happen just to make things more efficient in the same way that people used to use travel agents uh, to travel. And now it's actually, it used to be very inconvenient to call someone up just to book an airplane reservation. Now it's very, it's very simple. So there, there's certain, uh, the internet is very good at removing frictions, creating frictionless transactions and, transactions, and it's very hard for the real world to compete with this. So I think we see the continued movement of everything into cryptocurrency onto various blockchains. There are areas that I haven't even talked about on my channel that I want to talk about more. Uh, Non-fungible tokens, NFTs, art, collectibles, rare digital items. Obviously, Bitcoin is extremely rare. It's what's called a fungible token because one Bitcoin is equal to another Bitcoin. Non-fungible tokens would be, for example, a Picasso versus the Mona Lisa. They're 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 rare in the real world, and uh, but they're non non fungible. They're very different different artists. And then the other uh, really big area that I'm beginning to realize that cryptocurrency can can play a part in, besides rebuilding the entire financial system, banks are incredibly inefficient, etc. Uh, but uh, video games, e gaming, esports, this sort of thing, matches really well with crypto. My kids who do gaming online, they immediately understand Bitcoin because they're used to tokens. They just think in these terms. And so I think people who are bullish on physical gold over digital gold miss this point. And my kids have no interest in gold whatsoever in physical gold. Uh, it's always been a very bulky money technology as well, but they immediately get tokens. And that suggests that the future of store value and of everything else that has to do with the various functions of money as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, this all moves to the blockchain and a lot of it moves to Bitcoin. I'll link to my video about Bitcoin going to 288,000 uh, so you can study that. But I think the best investment for the next 100 years, and uh, I'm sort of working on this with my kids as well, is that you want to study and learn everything you can about this space. If you're interested in investing, Obviously, you don't have to be interested in investing or finance or anything like that. This is, um, you know, you're either interested in it or not. You're watching my channel, so I assume you have some interest, especially if you watch this far. What I would really focus on is learning everything you can about Bitcoin, Ethereum, stable coins, DeFi protocols, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, non-fungible tokens, NIFTs or NFTs. And a lot of the space is really new to me. Uh, I've known about Bitcoin for some time. 
unfortunately did not invest in it in the early years. But I've been recently doing a very steep learning curve trying to learn about Ethereum and all these other these other things. And it's a difficult, strange area. I haven't felt this this excited and this lost at, uh, since really since the late 90s and early 2000s. And I think we're really on this cusp of a cryptocurrency um, revolution. And when people ask me, I get a lot of college kids asking me, would I go into hedge funds or investment banking? I would definitely not at this point, even though I have a hedge fund background. It was a very good place to be in the early 2000s. Now they've basically been regulated uh, regulated out of existence and they've been sort of destroyed by passive uh, passive investing flows. But uh, And if you are going to do a hedge fund, obviously I'd say cryptocurrencies is an interesting place to focus. But the whole point of cryptocurrencies is monetary sovereignty, self-sovereignty over your financial life. And I think that investing in this area, maybe working, uh, working for a startup in this area, just learning as much as you can. Uh, if you understood the internet in the late 90s, you had a real uh, leg up against everyone else. And you could, um, I remember just laughing when people were telling me you'd never buy books online uh, and how Amazon was in a bubble. It just seemed totally absurd to me. Obviously with the iPhone, people caught on a little bit faster. Um, it was just really cool. But even, even so, Apple was just undervalued for many, many years. So if you understand this space and you have a feel for it and you don't just come in like a lot of my uh, viewers do and say, Bitcoin is a scam, Bitcoin is a fraud, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, it's a bubble, all cryptocurrencies are scams. This is just like being uh, being like Clifford Stoll and saying that the internet, bah, cryptocurrencies, bah, you're really doing yourself a disservice because this is a, a very exciting area. Um, we're, we're used to hearing Mark Andreessen saying software is eating the world. Well, cryptocurrencies are going to eat the financial world. Cryptocurrencies are obviously a form of software and they are going to completely take over the financial space. And so to the extent you can learn about them, you can get way ahead of everyone else, spot opportunities and not be distracted by sort of silly commentary that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. I'll link to this article on non-fungible tokens on nifties. One, one reason I'm interested in this is because of this website called Nifty Gateway. And they point out that digital items have existed for a long time. For example, you can have a, a sword or a skin in, in various video games. But the weird thing is then if you close your account, those digital possessions go away. And they're arguing that this would be like if Nike shut down, that all of a sudden your Air Jordans and your shoes would uh, disappear. So they're talking about how you can use blockchain to change this where you can actually buy digital items and hold them. And uh, two vin visionaries who, who recently bought Nifty Gateway through, uh, through their company, Gemini, are the, the Wink Winklevoss twins. Now these guys are really smart. They foresaw uh, social networking. They were very early investors, friends of Zuckerberg at, at Harvard and, friend, and uh, invested and worked for Facebook. They bought Bitcoin very early on, and um, I've been hearing them talk in various, various interviews about how important nifties are going to be. So I'm very happy to piggyback on those who are smarter than me, uh, like the, uh, the Winklevoss twins. And so I think this is a very interesting space. There's, there's lots of digital artwork you can start to collect, etc. Right now, the only thing I'm really invested in in this space is Bitcoin, where I, where I have the highest conviction. But I think by studying the space, it will really open up a lot more opportunities. And that's why my channel has been sort of veering toward uh, a much, much more weighted toward Bitcoin and cryptocurrency content. I'll link to uh, two videos that you can also watch when you're done with this if you want to kind of continue your exploration. One is what is DeFi, Beginner's, Di Beginner's Guide to Decentralized Finance. You've been hearing a lot about this and uh, I ignored it for a while and finally taking it seriously. And then here's an article on one of the DeFi protocols called MakerDAO and talks about st uh, stable coins, which are coins that are basically pegged to the US dollar, either pegged by a company or sort of algorithmically, uh, crypto cryptographically pegged. So check those articles out, those uh, videos out. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button and let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. If you have ideas about the cryptocurrency space that I should explore, let me know in the comments as well. Thanks a lot for listening. Hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll see you in the next video.